Hey everybody, it's Chris from Hanford Reach here. In honor of our debut album, After Image, coming out May 26th on Favorite Friend Records, I thought it'd be fun to do a bit of a podcast in honor of that and you know, talk a little bit about some of the songs and the stories behind the album and the recording sessions as we try and stay creative with our uh, social media promotion, um, particularly given the pandemic and the fact that we still can't theoretically play a show or yeah, I should say like play a proper show. So I've been doing a series of Instagram posts every Friday uh, since February, talking about what went into the album, sharing some pictures, um, and I wanted to expand a little bit more on that, can sort of nerd out a little bit on the album. And then in the second half of this, Leah and I do a little running commentary where we go into each of the songs and our memories that are tied to them and a little bit about the recording of each of those and the writing of each of those. Um, so I thought it'd be appropriate though to start with the discussion of what exactly is an after image, which is uh, an image that continues to appear in the eyes after a period of exposure to the original image, end quote. Um, so I felt like that sort of applied to all of the songs on the album overall as they're all tied to places and some even to literal photographs that I had taken. And it kind of ties into the general theme here of the album and of the songs and just the pieces of, of my life. Um, so the songs really came about just from, from having my eyes opened, um, you know, getting to see the world in, in ways that I hadn't before. Um, it made me, you know, think about some things that, that had been on my brain, but I could maybe not express um, those em emotions or those feelings properly. Um, and it sort of all came out in the writing here. Um, you know, overall, um, the tone of the album could could perhaps seem as, as a little dark, but I think it, part of it is looking at the back of the journey and the other half is looking forward to a sense of possibility. And it all told took a few attempts to figure out how to convey that musically um, and to keep it kind of straightforward, but yet to allow for various layers and you know for the songs to kind of have this haze over them. Um, so it's still all open to interpretation. I started writing this in the summer of 2018, and the, the writing was basically done in September 2019. So it was about 14 months total from start to finish. And if you also include Hidden Affinities, um, that one had been started when we did the Natalie EP. I was never gonna be ready for that. And um, we kind of built that up over time and it you know had its own standalone single release and and then got further tweaks of course for this album to to make it very distinctive and then the recording session started in september of 2019 it was a drum day and then there was a guitar day um bass and some backing vocals and then we went into um the bunker studio in brooklyn and overdubbed some keyboards and so that took us to about the end of 2019 um, and the skeleton was kind of in place of what the album was going to sound like. Uh, I don't think it was anywhere near the vision I had in my head, though, of where this could go. But it just didn't have any magic to it, if that's the right word we should use here. So I, I actually started purchasing some keyboards and decided that, you know, I just needed to do the rest of the recording in my apartment. And the funny thing about that is we got to a point in life where we all had to stay in our apartments. Um, so that afforded me, well, too many months on my own and just kind of tinkering with the songs and, and stripping everything back that had been recorded that didn't seem like it belonged there, making the songs a little more sleeker, a little more streamlined, but kind of giving them now like new layers and new depth and different sounds that the, that the synthesizers were gonna produce. And in the process, like completely give the album a facelift. And I think the end result of all that is, you know, what you're about to hear. And it's uh, a, like a mature take on psych pop, is how I would term it. You know, it's still rooted in the prog rock that I grew up on and just like is inherent in my writing style. Um, but it's, you know, taking cues from pop music and it's just moved into different territories. And, you know, lyrically, it's just straight ahead and kind of an honest emotional take on, on life as you're moving through life and different experiences that one's having. And I just can't state how proud I am of this album. And I'm really, really happy with the end result. Artists, we are our own worst critics. And I know particularly with myself, I'm, I'm pretty hard in hindsight on my music. 
and it's pretty rare that I can listen to something after the fact and think that it holds up. And and this album, you know, I I did not listen to After Image since the day after I got it back from mastering. I had listened to you know a few of the singles as they had premiered on on Spotify, but that's basically been it. I hadn't listened to the entire album as constituted, and I really really enjoyed that experience yesterday. And I hope all you guys have a very similar positive experience with it as well. But enough of my rambling. I'm going to. Um, spin a snippet of Hidden Affinities and then on the flip side of that we're going to hear um, a little commentary on each of the tracks from myself and Leah as we kind of look back at some of the memories and what went into the recording sessions a little bit further so thanks again for checking us out and uh, stick around for some music that one I have a lot of live memories tied to it yeah it is sick to play live it is just so fun and I look forward to playing it live again of course but oh, heck yes that one has a nice energy to it I think it's the perfect opener when when assembling the album you know the album is just sequenced in the order the songs were written not in a storytelling way or anything like that but the songs were just listed down on my computer that way and it, when it came time to sequence it it just kind of made sense to put it that way and because hidden affinities was always the opener which is why even though it had come out as a single it needed that revamp because it just belonged with these songs like it belonged on this album but it's just so fun that one has just i don't know lightness and joy to it you know maybe we should talk about the origin of that one it was written in San Francisco. Most of this album was written on various locations, which is which is sort of why it's tied to Polaroids. I feel like each of the Polaroids is a little snapshot of um, you know the songs. I don't I don't have the Polaroid specifically tied to this single track, um, but this was written in California, in San Francisco. The song is not about a person. The song is actually about a place, and it's just about it definitely maybe, sounds California. And it like, sounds like California. Hey when you leave that place, like you're kind of wishing you were still there a little bit. The title came about because that was written on a plane, or at least lyrically, the, that was written on a plane back from Warsaw. The music, I remember, Leah and I were in a rehearsal studio. We just we just finished the Natalie EP, and I remember saying, you're not going to believe this, but I have a new idea ready to go. And then I remember playing the drum part and then the, the main guitar piece, and then you chimed in on the bass, and then the verses were basically written like that day. Uh, one thing listening back to this that I really like was th is that the dropout that goes to the bridge. I really, really like that. And that one, I think, was even bettered when I remixed the album or retweaked the album or however you want to word it, and I added that little phaser. And I remember yeah. sending the final mixes around, and like the, originally there was phaser over that entire bridge, and then I realized that was probably, <laughs> probably overkill. Um, so I scaled it back to just that one little part. I think the fade out was right too. I remember mm. there was a there's a slightly longer version of this where it actually is a clean ending, kind of how it was done live. So 
so Malibu Gray Shades was the the first single from this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on how you count Hidden Affinities, but a, technically this was the first single from it. I think, you know, again, since we're talking about these being chronological here, that's the first one where you can kind of feel things are a little bit different, where the songwriting changed a little bit. Admittedly, the final product is way different than the original product. Um, and that was part of, you know, what I was talking about before with going back and completely revamping the album when I had access to all these synthesizers now and I kind of pulled out all the guitars for the most part and made the, these like layered synths and tried to give it like this haze that wasn't there previously to kind of bring out the mood of like Malibu gray shades. Like it needed just more of like a hazy sort of sheen over the top of it. No, you know a song is good when you listen to it a hundred times in a row making a video for it and you still think it's an awesome jam. Yes, this has a, <laughs> a good video that Leah directed and edited. <laughs> this is the first song where there's, it's not just nods, to, it's not just rock based, right? Like mm -hmm. the drum beat, mm -hmm. the drum beat is admittedly like something off a of Michael Jackson record. Like that's where that yeah. one, two, one, two, or however you want to count it came from. And even in the, in that second verse, there's that part where everything drops out except the drums. And that's like straight up from Bee Gees, like definitely a different feel. And I actually really like this. I think for me personally, like in what I'm listening to now, this is, this one holds up really, really well. And I'm really happy how this one turned out. When we were in the rehearsal space working on it, I think you said that it reminds you of the baseline to like a video game. Oh yeah, it reminded me of um, the w weird part in the dungeons in uh, the original Zelda. <laughs> Like in a good way. <laughs> well, I hope it's not, and I hope there's no copyright infringement, um, inadvertent copyright <laughs> infringement. But that, that's that's my memory of the writing session for that one. Um, and you know, if you've seen the video or whatever, uh, this this song was actually was written in Malibu at Zuma Beach uh, on a gray, cloudy morning, and it's just sort of about disillusionment, disillusionment. And that concept of like, if you were chasing the California dream and these were your first two days in Malibu, like, what would you think? And the song just came from there. Like and the lyrics were written like within two hours. That's an intense song. That one is sung with so much emotion. Um, it's played with emotion. And all uh, the effects add to it. Like everything is so much, but like obviously in a good way. <laughs> the, the ending is huge. That outro on the Mellotron is actually improv. Like that's not, like this was not rehearsed at <laughs> all. That was Dan standing in front of the Mellotron and playing that part. And then it was just like, no, that's the take. Like that is the take. I think that piece right there, I remember while I was mixing it, every time I get to that ending, it was just chills. That the, the guitar solo plus the Mellotron part and then where the, the backing vocal was kind of fade in, that outro really gets me every time. There's so much tension in it. There is and that's like the release. The yeah. ending is like the release that you need at the end of that song. Um, and honestly for a ballad, if you want to call it that, that one worked pretty well live, or I should say works, but I'm just referring to the before times. That one <laughs> started to creep into the set list, um, like at the tail end of you know 2019, it's beginning just so of 2020, powerful, like and it, it works. Ballads are tough to pull off on stage. I feel depending on where you're playing, it's tough to pull off that, and like that one worked. But it also, this one has so many elements of things that do Different work. Different feels, live. yeah. Like, and it has, you know, that really gritty, heavy feel to it. So it's not like a, a pretty, slow, boring song. It's, you know, awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's downstairs. And that one, you know, that's a pun, of course. That I, I got to sneak 
two puns into the song titles on this album. <laughs> I actually, it was a misspelling. It was an accident. Like it was not meant to be spelt that way. And I was so jet lagged that I wrote that instead of like, you know, downstairs. <laughs> and then I realized that it had a, it took on a whole different meaning because it actually could like imply, uh, you know, what I'm sort of the song, this song is, is about like communication issues. And it's mm-hmm. just like song is spoken from the recipient of those quote unquote downstairs that you're giving. Nice. That's, that's that one. we've been doing about it I keep saying I think that's my dark horse favorite on the album mm-hmm. I, I, I do stand by that statement uh, that one started with the drums um, that drum beat I started out as a drummer and so I like to just come up with beats and I file them away and that was one that I was really excited to use and so those verses were just that that drum part and then I had uh, a completely different synthesizer line um, but that was the basis of that, and then we filled it in around there. And the chorus is, you know, again, going back to the drums, that that is straight out of, like, you know, my skate punk days. Like, the, that chorus is, is, you know, Travis Barker or something. Like, but it's yeah. over, like, it's underneath, like, a psychedelic rock song. Mm. Um, and so this one, you know, one, one comment I've, I had heard from, you know, just, like, friends who I'd given the, this to before we had it mastered was, like, this track like stands out and that it sounds so different and I think that's because I w- it purposely sounds a little bit grittier the drums are distorted um, there's phaser over the track like a light phaser over the whole track like this was the one where it was like the kitchen sink production and and this is also the one that underwent the most drastic restructuring when it when the whole album got torn down this was the one where like it when it got stripped back to just like guitar, bass, and drums, and then everything got relayered on top of it, um, where it's like a night and day um, scenario. Yeah, it's totally different, completely. And the the bridge where, you know, everything drops out and it's just the synthesizers, completely improv like, uh, you know, when we were listening back to that now, Lee was saying that, you know, when we were getting ready to record it, like, we just left however many bars that is, yeah. like 16 bars, like literally just blank. And it was like, we'll fill it in later. We'll get to that another time. And then it just, the the (laughs) filling in just turned into like layering synth parts on top of synth parts. And like, I do stand by that decision. I think that's a great, a great piece in that track because you don't expect that. And it gives you a chance to kind of breathe um, in there. And then it kind of comes back in and hits you full force. Yeah. And I mean, that also, that part breaks it up enough so, so that it doesn't feel too much like a punk rock song on a psychedelic rock album. You know, it like, it helps it. That's Being true. More like us. That's true. And then lyrically, the song is, um, you know, sort of a, a more older, perhaps more jaded um, take on some of the themes that I had explored previously on, you know, old Sky Picnic songs. And there were a lot of songs about dreams on there. And they were all these like sort of optimistic, youthful looks at things.
so so finca, um, which is a, a Swedish coffee break, um, that was written in Sweden. I think uh, that little main riff. I remember walking down the street and that popped in my head, um, and I kind of just you know hummed it into the voice memos on my phone for when I could get near instruments to um, you know actually play it and write it. Um, but so the original idea, of course, was this was going to be sort of like you know the equivalent of like a coffee break, like a coffee break's a mm-hmm. short thing, right? So the idea was this song was really just going to be like a minute and a half, and it's going to be the little instrumental piece, and then the song would would end kind of change a pace before we get to the next track and that's how it was written and that's how you know it was rehearsed and that's how actually it well and then eventually when we played it on stage a few times that's we only did that short version but then what happened is when we went to record it i kind of just kept going on the drums and played that you know the main part but heavy i that guitar solo rips like i don't think I could ever play that again. That was one take, totally just jamming on guitar. Um, so that's like a nice moment for the record because there's not not really much uh, guitar soloing or like you know heavy guitar parts. I think the 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 standout piece though in this one is um, Dan's. I compare it to like something Brian Wilson would have done on Pet Sounds, um, the little keyboard solo in the first portion of the song. Um, it's just this nice little counter melody, and it's this kind of bright, perky. It just fits in with the whole coffee concept. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the whole feel of the whole thing is, oh, I guess we're playing a song. Cool. And it just feels really natural and free. And The fun fact here for me is, you know, because I, I redid this album, or, you know, whatever, revamped it during the pandemic, uh, and I didn't have all of the requisite gear that I wanted for this track. You know, that percussion at the beginning, that's not a shaker, that's actually a box of rice. <laughs> uh, that is a box of rice making that sound. Um, I'm pretty proud of that ingenuity. It's amazing. <laughs> Adventures, uh, that's the second pun on the album, or punny title, I should say. That has a long story, actually. The music predates, actually, Sky Picnic. Yeah. For the most part, I, I should say, like, the basic chord structure and stuff. It has a very, like, Beatles feel. I, to me, it's like it's like a very Beatles-esque song, which I think was probably at the time, or I know at the time, was what I was predominantly listening to. I think one day just kind of started playing that guitar riff. Uh, and realized that it was a really cool song and it needed to get dusted off and like actually turn into a legit song. And then it turned into this sort of like powerful psych pop song, um, you know, kind of keyboard driven. The tambourine's a nice touch. Like that just, yeah. that's what gives it that Beatles yeah. feel for me is that little, little tambourine in there. It's like something Ringo would have done. It's just one of those songs that, that feels like it goes by so fast because it's just moving and it keeps moving and you don't have time to dwell on the other part. And so you kind of want to go back and listen to it again. For this one, I had actually a really hard time with the bass line because it already existed so concretely in my head from the previous version. It was so catchy and I couldn't shake it. And when I finally got it to be something good, it was such a relief. And it was, I don't know, it was just, it felt so much better to make this song new and good. Always 
the title's half Swedish, half Polish. That one was another one that was written on that journey. Um, and that's sort of what the song is about. You know, half of it's sort of looking back at where you had come from, and the other half is that sort of sense of possibility of what lies in front of you. Mm. Um, I wrote that watching a sunset in Stockholm. One of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. And I pulled out the Polaroid and took a picture of that, and I started writing most of the lyrics that night. I think there was only a couple little bits that I had to, had to finish at a later date. And then the music to that was written the next day at a music shop in Stockholm. I just picked up like a guitar <laughs> off the wall and started writing those chords. Thing. I feel like I finally have like a good story, like a good <laughs> song creation story. And then the mm -hmm. outro, um, which, you know, conversely to Fika, this outro was completely mapped out. Um, every note of that guitar solo was basically written beforehand. It just the sound, that, that guitar sound, like I'm really proud of that sound. That ending came about because that week while I was in Sweden, I saw Dunyan play and like I, like I said, I had that first half of the song and it's like, but it needs to do something. It needs a resolution. And then it was just kind of like, well, what would Dunyan have done if this was their song? <laughs> I mean, it's just such, such a great shift right at the end when, well, I suppose not right, right at the end, but you think that the song's over, you're like, oh, mm, what a lovely, calm ending to an album. And then it hits you. I mean, there was no acoustic in this originally. That was like a, a like a phased electric guitar originally with like drums and full instrumentation and it all got stripped back um, and I laid down the acoustic and then you know that, that clapping is just me overdubbing overdubbing and overdubbing to make it sound like I was a group of people clapping because you know being in, in solitude there was really no other way right, um, you couldn't have a group of people clapping. and it's so different from everything on the album it's just it's got such a different feel like the, the acoustic guitar coming in and like you know those not that the choruses are you know dissimilar to anything else on on the record like you know hidden affinities has a, a, a soaring chorus but this one has like that really intense like that's another one like downstairs where it's just emotions are fully out i, I really stand by this work Right, I mean, every song is something to be proud of. Yeah, and it was good to give up that idea that it needs to be able to be recreated exactly live. And especially with your remixes that you did for Instagram Live, like. Mm -hmm. And well, I think there was the fear that there might not be shows again. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, every one of us, every musician probably had that moment of just like, wow, I may not get to play live again, you know? Yeah. And like, so I think yeah. if you have a song that's good enough and, and you want to play it live and like you're worried about being able to play the parts on stage like good for you you know like that's a good thing mm -hmm. so once you get past that piece of worrying about playing it the same way on stage it kind of opened up those doors of like you know what? I'm just gonna put whatever I want on this so thanks for listening to um, this hopefully you enjoyed it so hopefully you got something out of it um, I have admittedly never tried to do any sort of podcasty thing before, so this is a first for me too. But as Leah had just mentioned, I did some special corn streams um, <laughs> and kind of like rebuilt all the songs. Trent up. Reznor'd them. Trent Reznor'd the songs. <laughs> um, and that's an honor, by the way. I've Trent Reznor'd the song. So yeah. if you haven't seen any of them, they're on the Instagram and on the YouTube page. Um, and like they're nice little alternate takes on on all of this so if, you know there was a song in here that you or there's a song on the album i should say you know that you like but maybe wish it was something different like you should check <laughs> out those streams because those those are completely alternate takes on everything but uh again thank you for listening and uh please check out the album um hanfordreach.bandcamp.com you can spotify us or apple music us or any of the other places that i don't really know uh cassette tapes how can you get one of those? You can get a cassette tape on the band camp. Amazing. Or at a future show. Yeah, we're going to take this to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys.